Praise God, church. Turn your Bibles to Psalms 25. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame. Nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come to those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love. For they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. God, good and upright, is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful towards those who keep the demands of his covenant. That's the reading. Amen. Let's appreciate Sharon. Thank you so much. Why don't you give the Lord a big round of applause and just say I. I don't know how many of you are waiting on the Lord, um, but today I have a question before we even begin um, hearing God's word. And the question that I have for us uh, requires some level of realness, all right? I want you to be real. I want you to be vulnerable. And I know we all must up and it might be difficult for us to communicate adequately. But my question to all of us today is this. When were you ever in a big mess? All right? I'm not talking about those small, tiny messes. I'm talking about a real big one. One that was earthquake shaking, like life altering. Um, and, and you were facing a huge mess. And then the other question is, how did you get out of it? Okay? So why don't you turn to somebody who looks like they want to talk to you and just ask them that question. When were you in a big mess? And how did God bail you out of it? Yes. Today, I want, you, I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> that one might require that you edge a little closer. Edge a little closer. Let me tell you something about my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, some of you don't have neighbors to talk to. It's okay. You can talk to the Lord. <laughs> All right, keep talking, keep talking. How did you get out of it? How did you get out of it? Okay, let's pray. T tell your neighbor, hold on there. I want to hear this story after the service, all right? I want to hear this story after the service. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are starting a new month, Lord. We are starting a new month. But Lord Jesus, as a church, we want to gather around those of us who are in the process of sliding into a deep mess in their lives. Lord, today, my Father, we are praying with each other for those of us who have messed up and are facing terrible consequences, Lord, painful consequences, Father. And our one cry today is, Lord, you may take us, get us out of this mess, Lord, that you may deliver us from this mess that we got ourselves into, or maybe, Lord, that just landed on us. Lord. So, Father, we pray that your hand of deliverance, your hand of faithfulness may release us and deliver us from this mess. For it is in Jesus' mighty name and everybody say amen and amen. Look at that neighbor and tell them it will be well if you're still in that mess. Amen. You can have your seats. You can have your seats. To, to our visitor today, my name is Pastor Brian Bugua and I'm a pastor here in this church and I'm so glad to see all of you here today. Um, and, I, and I hope you can join us after this in the visitors' lounge. We want to get to know to know you more. So today I want to talk about this message and ask the Lord that He would deliver us from this mess, from this mess. What is a mess? A mess, you know, there, there's um, what you call trouble, and there's what we call a mess. A mess is difficult to explain and even describe because it's something bad, it's something ugly. Something that's shameful and embarrassing and troublesome. It's a situation that keeps growing and is difficult to solve. It's difficult to, to end or to stop because it continues to have lifelong consequences that are both 
complex and intertwined, all right? Have you ever been in those situations that, that don't seem to end? I mean, they just keep growing and multiplying and dealing with one thing here affects this one. So you can't deal with it this way because it affects this one. And they are all intertwined and yet you're caught up in this mess. So today, my prayer goes out to somebody who has come to this church. Somebody who is sitting here and on the inside you're screaming out, yelling out for help, saying, Lord, deliver me. Get me out of this mess. And I want to encourage you that your fear is not fatal. You have to learn to trust in God, that God is an all-able God, that there's nothing too difficult for God to deal with, and he can make a mess, he can make good sense out of this mess that you are in. You have to trust in God's restorative power. You have to trust in his ability to deliver you out. Rely on his strength that is perfected in your weakness. Because today what I hope you can do is admit that, Lord, I am weak. I'm unable to get myself out of this situation. In fact, Lord, I got myself in this situation and now I'm trusting you to get me out of this situation. So if you're that person, don't even raise up your hand. I just want you to whisper to yourself and say, Lord, get me out of this mess. And for me, I'm saying amen. But before we even get there, before we even get to the place where the Lord is helping us deal with our mess, one thing I hope we can all accept is that choices have consequences. All right? Choices have consequences. I know you know that, but I want you to see how that plays on in our lives and how, how, how it results into these complexities and into these messed up situations that keep growing and are difficult to resolve. Yes, you see, there's an African proverb that says, do not look at where you have fallen, but look at where you slipped. Amen. Because many times when we're trying to make sense of our lives, we look at where we have fallen. We tend to look at our pain. We tend to look at our suffering. We tend to look at our confusion. We tend to look at our brokenness, at our infirmity, at our suffering. And we fail to look at what resulted into that mess. Amen. So today I'm really, really praying that God may bring you to that place where you can trace your way back to see, aha, this is where my foot slipped. Because indeed choices have consequences. It is important because Galatians 6 and verse 7 says, do not be deceived. Do not fool yourself. Do not be deceived because God cannot be mocked. This is, a, this is a very powerful scripture that says, whatever you put down, whatever you plant, you are going to reap. So right now you are enjoying the fruits of whatever you have kept sowing now, so now and, and on. I mean, you're continually sowing this. So the Bible is saying, a man reaps what he sows. So the question is, what are you sowing right now? You see, many of us, when we, when we go to a tree and we take the fruit and we're enjoying how sweet it is, we fail to relate with what is buried under the ground. That there, is a, there was once a seed that was buried inside the ground and it was covered and it was watered and weathered. And after a period of time, it resulted into a tree that continued to grow and season after season, it matured and now it's bearing forth fruit. So we fail to relate with that concept because it's unseen, it's, it takes long. So right now you're probably investing in actions of which you're going to reap the fruits later on in your life. So I want to encourage you by the grace of God, do not just look at where you have fallen, but I want you to look at where you're sleeping. Amen. Because do not be mocked. This, this sometimes is painful because you can engage in prayer, you can engage in, in fasting, you can engage in, in repentance, but some consequences are lifelong. Amen. Some consequences live with you. They leave marks on your body. They leave marks in your life. They leave lifelong wounds. Do not be deceived. Job chapter 4 and verse 8 says, I have observed. And probably this is a saying of people as who are trying to make sense of job suffering. He says, I have observed that those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. Okay? So what are you sowing? Okay? 
Because that is what you're going to get. You cannot plant an orange and reap an avocado. It is impossible. It is a spiritual law of, of spiritual farming. This is a concept of spiritual farming that seeds of evil will only produce after their kind. Amen. Hosea 8 and verse 7. Hosea is saying something very dangerous, and this is a matter we see in life. He says, and this was of the people that were, were sowing their dependence on man and not on God, and God was saying to them, they sow the wind and they will reap the whirlwind. So probably right now you're sowing small actions, but you're going to reap bigger than what you sowed, okay? This is, this is to somebody, you're, you're, sowing, you're sowing rebellion, but you're going to reap a war, all right? So be careful, be careful. Some of these things explode on you. They have a multiplying effect, okay? You're, you're sowing a, a spark, but you're going to reap an explosion. So, so be very careful what you plant in your life, what you're sowing in your life, because these choices have consequences, amen? And maybe you're looking at your life and you're wondering, what brought me here? What did I do to earn this? Because your way out of this mess, even as God deals with you, will be determined by your ability to begin planting in the right seeds. Amen. That is your work. That is your part. So it is important that we don't just get stuck on the consequences. Pastor, my family is falling apart. Pastor, my finances are in a mess. Pastor, I've been told by the doctor my health is a mess. Pastor, my kids and all these things. You're looking at the wrong place. Don't look at your brokenness, your debt. Don't look at all this. Look at where it is coming from. Because that's how God is going to help you deal with it. And I want you to understand as the Lord is encouraging us here today, that our ability to come out of this mess is tied to our willingness to begin to stop what we are sowing and begin sowing that which is right. And Hosea says this in Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. He says, sow righteousness for yourselves. Righteousness benefits not anybody else but yourself. This is something you're doing for yourself. You will earn the fruits. You will reap the fruits for yourself. This is for your own good, for your own benefit. So righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love, of depending on God. And listen now, he's, he's showing us the process of spiritual farming. He says, break up the unplowed ground, the unfollowed ground. Break up that ground in your heart that is barren and idle. We love to say that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. But let me tell you, the heart can do bad just by itself. Amen. The heart is desperately wicked. If left unplowed, if left untamed, it is going to produce weeds. Amen. This is why you must break ground. Something in your life must break. You cannot just induce truth where lies have dwelled forever. There must be a breaking. There must be a shaking. There must be a transition. There must be a breakthrough in your life in order for you to put in God's seeds. Amen. So he says, break your ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Amen. Your way out of this mess, even as you pray, is going to be found in you seeking after God, looking for God, not just with a half-hearted sense, but seeking God with all your heart because you're tired of this mess. You're tired of paying the price. You're tired of these consequences and you're saying, my life must change. Lord, get me out of this mess. And then listen. So he says, you break the ground. That is your part. You break the ground. Listen to the Lord. Heed what he's saying. Open up your heart. If you allow this word to settle in your heart and in your mind, listen to what it says. For it is time to, until he comes, spiritual farming, and showers his righteousness on you. Showers his, when God begins to shower his blessing on the word that has fallen on your heart, it begins to produce. Amen. 
And I want us to learn what this really is all about. It's about depending on the Lord. Many people farm, but not many harvest, right? Many people work hard, but very few succeed. So God is trying to tell, even as, as he was saying to the people in the book of Hosea, you have shown yourselves that you can depend on yourselves, that you can make it by yourselves. And now you're going to reap a whirlwind. You're going to reap chaos because you want a life away from me. But God is saying when you depend on me, then you depend on me for the whole process. Don't just take my seed and then say, goodbye God, I got this, I can do this by myself. The process of spiritual planting teaches us that God is involved from the beginning to the end. One, the seed is not yours. Two, the ground is not yours. The rain is not yours. You don't decide when the sun will shine and when the heat will come and what temperature it will be. All that belongs to God. Therefore, even as we desire to get out of our mess and we break the ground because that's all that we can do, as we break the ground, we must depend on God to bring rain and bless us of all that we have learned so that he can mature us and grow us and deliver us and make us fruitful. So now I want us to look at the life of somebody who was in a real mess. Somebody say a real mess. Let's look at David. Amen. This, you see, David, David was a brother who loved the Lord. And, and this, is, this is my encouragement to you guys. David is such an example of a person who was in a mess. But his mess never got him out of God's love. The problem with us is we mess up and we run away from the one person that can deliver us. Amen. We, we allow our shame and our guilt uh, and, and, uh, and, and our punishing of ourselves to, to forget the one God who can get us out of this trouble. But David had a confidence. There's something David knew about God that many people seem not to understand. He understood that God is faithful. That's why Psalm 25 and verse 1, he begins by saying, I trust you, Lord. I know you are able to deal with me. Many people cannot deal with how messed up I am. Many will get tired, but I trust you that even if I come again and again and again, you are good enough to work with me. Amen. I came to tell you that God is the kind of God who is for again and again and again and again. Let's give him a big round of applause because I want you to run to God. Run to God because he's able to deliver you. He doesn't sit there and count and say, you came in January, you came in February, you came in March. I'm, he will never get tired of helping you. A broken and a contrite heart, the Lord will not despise. Give him a big round of applause. Amen. So if you're there, if you're there, if you're there, you're in the right place. Run, seek after him, chase him because he will be found. But let's look at David. You see, David made some bad choices that resulted in bad consequences. Amen. So the Hosea talks about breaking ground, all right? This ground was idle. Let me just make an example of David. David is supposed to go to battle, right? This is the month and the time and the season when the sun shines and the armies can go to war because food is all over the place. They don't even need to carry food with them because this is the season where so armies can find food and this is when kings go to battle. But David says, this time round I'm not going to battle. And he decides I'm going to enjoy the view. All right? And indeed he sees good things. All right? Somebody say good things. You know where I'm headed with this, but I'm going to cut, cut this movie short, all right? You all know what happened. But David made some bad choices. He saw somebody taking a shower, and he decided, I'm going to get me some. Amen. I'm, go I'm the king, all right? What I, what I want, I get, and I want that right there. That right there seems good for me. I mean, I, I have suffered. How many of you have ever felt, let me cut myself some slack, I have suffered. I've been fighting for all of you here. What do I get for it? What do I get for it? And he said, bring me that one. But let me cut this story short. So David sowed covetousness. Somebody say a seed. A small seed called covetousness. Wanting that which is not yours. You remember when Hosea says you, you, will, you will sow a, what? a wind 
but you will reap her. Now, let's consider what covetousness produced for David. One, it resulted in adultery. Two, it resulted in deceit. Because now he has just gotten his best friend's wife pregnant, right? Now they have to work within a window period to make sure that this guy sleeps with his wife so that somewhere there he can say, how come these kids look? This kiddo looks like David. But he says, where? How? Maybe you are thinking too much of me. Maybe it's because I'm the king, right? So after this guy came out of battle, he was trying to get him to go home. But this man said, I cannot go home. I must stay with my soldiers. <gasps> Somebody said, trouble. Because he's not going home to sleep with his wife. And he knows there's something in there. Hmm? You know, when you, when you have a nose like mine, how many of you have ever seen my daughter called Wema? I mean, surely, some of us have kids, even if you deny. I mean, you're, you're joking. I mean, what, what are you saying? What are you saying? Utasema usi wako, surely. I mean, Wema's nose is mine. Her head, she has a forehead, just like mine. So how, how can I even say that this one, eh? <laughs> You know, I don't want to create chaos here, but how, how many of you have ever walked around town and you see somebody who looks like, eh? Well, but can I say only ladies know, eh? But that one you shall discuss in the ladies' ministry, okay? But he's so deceit because now he's trying, but when the plot did not work, he resulted in murder. He murdered his own friend. He reaped not only that, now this is what he reaped. This is what he planted. And now we are going to go now to 2 Samuel from verse, chapter 12 from, from verse 10 to 14. And we are going to see exactly what he, saw, he reaped. Death, rape, rebellion, incest, and war. What did it start with? Covetousness. Second Samuel, this is where Nathan has come and he's talking to him and he's telling him the judgment from the Lord. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And this is why I love David, guys. Because if it was some of us who would have said, but, 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 but I was, ah, I was horny. But, but, but my wife was not good enough. But, 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 it was just a small mistake. No, say I have sinned against the Lord. Amen. Let's call the truth what it is. Because what keeps a mess a mess is the fact that you're in denial and you're refusing to accept that, yes, you did it. Accept it and then let the Lord break your heart and make you right. Amen. Some of us need to accept that we are financially indisciplined. Some of us need to accept the fact that we don't know how to handle our wives, our husbands, our kids, because we are going to continue with this mess if we keep on thumping our chest, saying, I know how to do it. I, I got this all figured out. No, you don't accept. Like David say, it is the truth. This is a play. I have sinned against the Lord. I did it. Somebody whisper to yourself and say, I did it. I did it. I remember there was a, a secular song. I should have gone to work, but I got high. But I got high. So you're blaming, you, you got fired, not because you got high, but because of something else, right? What is causing you to want to get high in the first place? That is the seed I'm talking about, amen? So let me go on because I have little time here. So this is what David ripped. The death of his firstborn son with Bathsheba. Later on, he had a son known as Amnon. Amnon raped his own daughter. So this is incest in his house. Then a brother comes and says, ah, you cannot rape our sister like this. 
chap murder in the house. But he grows up and he says, you know what, I also can be king. And he ends up bringing a rebellion. It all started with what? Covetousness. What, so, what seeds are you sowing in your life right now? But I love Psalm 25. Because David is not the kind of guy just to say sorry. He's following up with his sorry. You know, there are guys who keep saying sorry, sorry, sorry. So pastor, I slap you on the face and I say, God, guys, sorry, sorry. Then I punch you on the stomach. Then I say, oh, yeah, yeah. Him banapasi, sorry, sorry. Then I step you on your foot. Then I say, him guyangu, mbona inakupenda if. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sometimes sorry doesn't cut it. Amen. Sorry won't get it solved. Sometimes I, I like apologetic people, but if you have mastered the art of deceptive apologies, then you will keep being in that mess. So David was the kind of guy who said, I'm sorry. But he says, I want to make it right. Look at Psalm 25, 11. He, admi he admits his sin. He says, for the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. He says, yes, I have sinned, but he says, I've sinned really bad. Psalm 25 and verse 15, David admits he's drowning, he's confused, he's lost. He says, for only he will deliver my feet from the snare. There are some people in this church who are Tied. Your feet are, have been caught in a net. You can't get out of this debt. H have you ever been in so much debt that you yourself are a pyramid scheme? Because you borrow here to pay here. Then when this one asks you get this, you pay this. Then when this one, when they all come, now you wonder. Now you run away from them, you borrow here, you move to Kisumu County, you start another one, then you pay this one. You, you are in a mess. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He's saying, my feet have been caught by the net. Psalm 25 and verse 16, he admits the consequences of his sin and he says, turn to me and be gracious for I am lonely and afflicted. Psalm 25 and verse 2, he's not just lonely and afflicted because you know, let me tell you something about being in a mess. When you're in a real, real mess, I'm not talking about a tiny mess. Your friends run away from you. Because they discover this one I cannot help. Have you ever been in so much trouble? No, not one person can deal with your <laughs> issue. Eh? People start, because your life is complicated. In fact, people are afraid of you because Nikama, have you ever seen people drowning in the ocean? I mean, you, you don't want them to get a hold of your feet because you'll drown with them. All right? He says, do not put me to shame or let my enemies triumph over me. David was in so much trouble. He was not just in a mess, but now his enemies were coming to say, even God is not with you. You're not a leader anymore. You can't lead us. How, how, how can you lead us with all this mess? Look at your kids. Look at what is happening in your household. Da, the Lord is not with you. Bounce. And he's saying, I'm lonely and afflicted. Lord, deliver me. Psalm 25 and verse 17, he says, relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. There's somebody here and the Lord will deliver you. Amen. The Lord will get you out. Amen. But I want to focus on 25 and 4 to 5. David says, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths and guide me in your truth. And teach me for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Let me tell you what David was trying to say here. He was trying to say, Lord, I just don't need little help. I need a lot of help. Don't just tell me where to go because I can see, I can see, but Lord, I, I need you to also teach me. And don't just teach me, guide me. How many of you have ever been given directions, especially in some of these very confused places? And somebody tells you, Sasa ukifika pale amboseli, usiende na ile agitanga, kata hivi. Alafu wa Kenya wengi tunakuanga, eh, and hapa hakuna kitu ujashika, but uko tu, eh, you know? Alafu unaenda hapo na muliza, we, kuna get ya blue? Ati, ah, chali, rudi pale umetoka, nataka ukifika hapo ni pigie. If you understand that this is not just about direction, sometimes it's about the complexities of life. This is why David says, don't just show me, 
teach me. Don't just teach me, guide me, because I cannot do it by myself. Amen. David was willing to see things the way God saw them. He was willing to be guided in God's truth. He was willing to be taught and schooled to walk in God's paths because he understood that the problem is not that he has fallen. The problem is that there is a wet floor somewhere. There is a slippery surface somewhere. And he discovers even though he's lifted up, he might not be able to walk right. He needs God. Amen. At the end of the day, you cannot make it without God. You need God from the alpha to the omega of your life. Amen. So I have three quick questions for you that I want to ask as we close. Number one, are you willing to see things as God sees them? Because you're where you are because you're blind. There are certain things you've not seen. But band, I want you to chill a bit as I, as I teach this. There are certain things you have not seen. That's why you keep falling in the same place now and then. Today, tomorrow, you will keep falling until your eyes are opened. Like David, pray that God may show you what you're not seeing. You see, there is no salvation without revelation. Amen. There is no salvation that will come to your life without revelation. So pray that God may open up the eyes of your heart that you may see like David, I, and say, I am a sinner. Amen. So are you willing to see things the way God sees them? Are you willing to see and accept the things that he shows you? Just like we, we always see in the movie, yes, I know you want the truth, but can you handle the truth? Can you bear what God shows you about yourself? Are you willing to allow God to tell you, yes, you're proud, you're arrogant, you're selfish, yes, you have hatred, you have bitterness, you have rage, you are insecure. This is why you keep buying things you don't need. This is why you keep doing the things you're doing. You're, you're planting the wrong seed because there's an error somewhere in your life. Let God show you what you've never seen about yourself so that you can begin to unshackle your life. Amen. His perspective will inspire your approach to your life. Number two, are you willing to be taught by God your Savior? Like David, pray and say, God, teach me your paths. I know, I know, I know, Lord, I, I should do this, I know. But how do I do this? Amen. Some of us need to take God like we take Google and say, this is where I need to go. Show me. And God will tell you, now you are here. Now here you need to turn left, right. Here, slow down. Then rush and you need God to be your teacher. But are you willing to learn? Are you humble enough to be taught and to be schooled because there is no salvation without submission? Remember the rich young ruler. Everybody who comes to Jesus must accept that he knows and we don't. You must accept, even in the prayer of salvation, you say, you are God and I am not. You are the savior. I am the sinner. Submission. And the last one, are you willing to be guided in all truth? Are you willing to be led because there is no salvation without surrender? Amen. There is no salvation without surrender. You see, it's one thing for you to go to somebody who knows finances and to say, I'm in debt. And it's one thing for him to tell you now, you need to cut down on your fast food intake. You don't have to go to Java Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And it's another for you to say, eh, hey, but nani Java? Eh, usikate Java? Eh, uko ndiyo miu make my deal? That's where I meet my clients. Eh, hey, no, don't cut my Java. My friend, you'll continue being in the same hole. Until you break ground and allow God to show you, my friend, you can take cocoa and, and, and take uh, whatever, in ito nini. Cadbury's chocolate and mix it and get mocha and leave. You can make it at home. You don't need to go to Java and spend all that money until that truth sinks here. You won't start saving. Amen. You need somebody to teach you, not just to tell you save. How do you save? But even if he shows you how to save, then you must surrender and say, I'm going to move from this expensive house and move to this cheaper house. Amen. There is no salvation without 
So as we conclude, David bounced back. We know his story. God helped him. And as the worship team comes forward as we close now, my question for you is this. Are you willing to see things as God sees them? Are you willing to say, I'm blind because you are? Are you willing to be led by God? Are you, are you willing to be taught by God? But right now I'm trusting that God is going to transform your life. Right now I'm speaking into your life by faith. Your life will never be the same again. May God's word gain entrance into your heart. Yes, you're sorry, but sorry won't cut it. How badly do you want it? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord. Some of us are drowning, Lord Jesus. Drowning in debt. Drowning in marriages. Drowning in illicit relationships, oh God. Drowning in substances, Father. Some of us, Lord, yes, we, we have come to the end of ourselves and we are crying, saying, Lord, make a way for me to come out, Lord Jesus. And Lord, today you have posed some critical questions to us, Lord. And I believe that in this month, Lord, your, your Holy Spirit will begin a work of deliverance from bondage. We are saying our lives are going to change. Our finances are going to change. Our businesses are going to grow. My Father, our families are going to improve. Our children, Lord, are going to toe the line and become a source of pride and joy. Lord, our health, my Father, is going to be reset and led in the right direction. Lord, deliver us from this mess, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Stand up to your feet. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Pray for yourself. I can live without Pray for yourself. I can live without yes, pray for yourself. Say, enough is Tell enough. Me, what can I do? This is the end. This is the end. I, I'm not going I on this way anymore. Deliver me, Lord Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Worship Him. Worship Him. He's your help. He's your help. Tell Him, I can live, I can live without you, Jesus. I can live without you, Lord. I can live without you, Jesus. Say, I can live. change. Today is the day that we stop saying sorry and we start making changes Lord. And that one change Lord can reap great benefits for us. Lord we want to start by admitting the Lord we, 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 we have the wrong attitudes Lord. We have sin in us Jesus. Help us Lord. I pray that you may break us from this bondage Lord. Take, take the snare from our feet and help us to experience your freedom. In Jesus' mighty name we do pray. And everybody say amen and amen. Amen. And now, and now may the Lord bless you. May he bless you with humility. May he bless you to know that you are his child. May he turn his face towards you and show you things that you've not seen before. May he teach you and walk with you and show you favor. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next Sunday. God bless you. Amen.